This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Pendleton Whiskey, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Born in the iconic American Western town of Pendleton, Oregon, and taking its name from one of the most revered rodeos in the world, my absolute favorite rodeo, known for the grass, the Pendleton Roundup. Pendleton Whiskey is a modern celebration of a century-old tradition. Pendleton Whiskey is barrel-aged in American oak and cut with Glacier Fred spring water from Oregon's Mount Hood. For an uncommonly smooth, rich taste, and complex flavor, the Pendleton Whiskey brand honors a heritage that inspires us to live boldly, never lose sight of the values we believe in, and taste the moment, wherever we may be. The legacy of the American cowboy is forged in every single bottle. A taste of true Western tradition is always worth raising a glass to. Discover more at PendletonWhiskey.com. Oh, and Pendleton Whiskey is the official whiskey of Pro Rodeo and of the PBR. Pendleton Blended Canadian Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, Pendleton Distilleries, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Please drink responsibly. Bill Fick Ford, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country, is still taking care of their customers. It's hard to get trucks right now, but there's some perks when you're the number one Super Duty dealer in the country. You still got trucks. Go to BillFickFordHuntsville.com to get the no bull discounts that no one else is giving during this crazy time that we're living in. Bill Fick Ford is still the place to go. In fact, if you ask me, it's the only place to get a new Super Duty dealer today. Bill Fick Ford. Who wants to be Rodeo's next millionaire? It's time. That time again through the WCRA, you can win $1 million by nominating your rides or runs and earning points through the WCRA. Through the Triple Crown of Rodeo, the WCRA will award $1 million in cash prizes to any one athlete or collection of athletes who wins first place in any three consecutive WCRA major rodeos. $1 million is completely up for grabs. The days of 47 Cowboy Games and Rodeo will be the second stop of the 2021 Triple Crown of Rodeo Series. The event will pay out over $560,000 and will be held July 20th through the 24th in Salt Lake City. Get this, there will be zero entry fees, people. You heard me correctly. No entry fees. The only way to qualify for the Triple Crown of Rodeo event is by nominating your rides and runs with the WCRA. Use promo code GAGE10 for 10% off your next nomination. Again, that promo code is GAGE10 for 10% off your next nomination. To learn more, just visit WCRA Rodeo dot com and learn how you can earn a spot at the days of 47 rodeo and possibly be rodeo's next millionaire what what sets resist all apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand these traditions are passed down from fathers to sons from heroes to future champions since 1927 Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it every day. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado on this episode of the podcast. We're back. Uh, I had COVID, so we had to cancel a bunch of episodes. Sorry about that. Anyways, my health, uh, COVID sucks. Whatever. Uh, we came back strong, though. We've got the Down Under Horsemanship guy, Clinton Anderson. I had a great time with Clinton. I didn't know really anything about him other than wildly successful horse guy. Um, yeah, probably not the best one for your children, but yeah, this podcast is epic. Had a lot of fun with Clinton. Uh, I think he says a lot of the things that we all think about the industry, but he can say it, and he does say it. Check it out. Yeah, I mean, your approach is is like the most modern in the horse industry, and yeah. it's because you've been at it for so long yeah. that you've went from like almost like the VHS VHS mm-hmm. VHS oh, yeah. tapes all the way to like full on streaming. Yeah, so mm-hmm. that's one of the really unique things I find about you that I think I'd like to talk to you about is kind of how you've gotten with the times so well because. Yeah. You, I mean, you just see so many people fail at modernizing in this industry because, mm-hmm. you know, they don't want to untuck their boots. That's you know, exactly for lack right. of a better term. Yeah. So, but to kind of give our listeners a, a better idea, um, who you are, what what you do. Obviously, it's pretty transparent. Uh, you've done amazing with your website. I mean, as far as 
in, in the horse world, I don't think anybody has a better website than that. Usually they're pretty pathetic. And yeah. yours is very well done. Oh, thank so you. I guess maybe like we go all the way back to like maybe your childhood. Mm-hmm. Obviously you're not from here. You're from Australia. Mm-hmm. And you always wonder when you look at someone who's been able to capture a certain type of success especially with horses, right? Because it's a very specific type of person. Yeah. Right? Like there's a very linear path to becoming a professional football player. Everybody mm-hmm. knows that path or a professional soccer player or whatever. But you get a really different background on somebody who wants to thrive in the horse industry. Right. And, right. and so, I mean, what was your childhood and, and all that like that kind of oh, pushed you? I grew up in a place called Cairns uh, in Queensland, Australia. So the best way to describe it would be like Miami, Florida, hot, tropical beaches, Great Barrier Reef. Um, so not horse country by any means, but my grandmother and grandfather had just, you know, uh, pets on the farm, just a cup, two or three horses on the farm. So my grandmother was very involved in horses and she got me and my sister, the grandchildren involved just by hanging out at the family farm and, and uh, playing with them and so forth. So me and my sister had quite a bit of interest in the horses and um, she encouraged that quite a bit. And then, we you know, uh, I got into another game, so that lasted a while, and then I got into a game of po- uh, called Polo Cross in Australia, which is like, it's like a redneck version of Polo. <clears throat> you know, Polo, you need, you know, six, eight horses, and you've got to be filthy rich in Australia. We just ride the <laughs> shit out of one. So <laughs> we get one horse and ride sh- the dog shit out of it for 45 minutes. <laughs> is it a shorter field or anything, or is it all I don't the same know. size uh, pitch? It, it, I don't know. It might be a little small. I didn't follow Polo much, but it's pretty big. But but it's it, the joke. It's kind of a joke, but it, that's the thing. Things that make jokes funny is they got some truth to them. And the joke <laughs> about Polo Cross is it's it's poor man's Polo. Yeah. So in a Polo, you know, you got lots of different horses the guys ride. In Australia, we're all poor, so we got one fucking horse and we <laughs> ride that one till it collapses and dies, and then we get another one. So I played Polo Cross for for several years as a kid. That got me more into being competitive and then to get into the – but I didn't know anything. I always craved knowledge, always wanted to do more with horses, but – Back in those days in Australia, there wasn't uh, – the whole natural horsemanship clinician deal hadn't taken off. You know, Ray Hunt was coming to Australia in the se- late 70s doing clinics, but nobody ever really heard of it or y- – it wasn't mainstream as it like it is now. You know, there wasn't – books on it the only books in australia were like english horse riding lessons jumping hunter jumpers that kind of stuff so i wasn't i wasn't exposed to any types of training techniques that got into horses minds or made them better so when i was 13 actually no when i was close yeah actually about 13 i went to a big polo cross state championships in a place called one uh in uh southeast uh queensland or it might be in the middle of south of queensland and I got introduced to a guy that told me about another horseman called Gordon McKinley. Basically, polo cross riders are really good riders, but as a general rule, they have kind of shitty horsemanship. You know what I mean? We just ration, you know, pull and yank and and, and uh, carry on. And uh, I didn't have very good horsemanship skills, so I was recommended to go to this guy called Gordon McKinley for a horsemanship clinic. So my parents, I was 13, drove me and my grandparents drove me 22 hours to go to a place called Longreach. And it's in Queensland, Australia. It's kind of in the middle of the outback, like 22 hours from where I lived. And so I went to my first horsemanship clinic when I was 13. It was in 1988. And then the whole, everything opened up for me then. When I saw Gordon McKinley start colts, work with horses, it was like a colt starting slash general horsemanship clinic. That's when I knew there was a whole nother world of shit that I was looking for. I was always craving a lot of knowledge, but I didn't know how to get it. I didn't know anybody. I would ask anybody that knew more than me, which is pretty much fucking everybody. Okay, so I've always asked a million questions. When I want to know something, I'm not shy. I start asking questions. Yeah, so no ego whatsoever. No, I yeah. start asking questions. And... Um, but I couldn't get a lot of answers. And when I found this guy, it's like the Holy Grail opened up and I like, okay, this some bitch has got exactly what I need. And luckily enough, I must ask this guy five million questions. And for a kid, that's kind of rare because most kids are a little shy. And, you know, I was asking a lot more questions than the adults, better questions than the adults. I wasn't shy. I was shoving myself in the middle of the group and saying, hey, what about this? What about that? And for whatever reason, he must have seen something in me. So he told my parents if I wanted to come down on school holidays, he would take me on as a kind of an intern kid under his wing. And I did that for a couple of years. During, you know, you call them summers over here, but in Australia we have eight weeks of school, two weeks holiday, eight weeks of school, two two weeks holiday, and then at the end of the year in December you get six to eight weeks off. So every chance I got to leave school, I went down to his place and kept learning. 
And then when I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a horse trainer. That's what I wanted to do. I hated school. I wasn't very good at it. I never graduated high school. So I left high school at 15 and went to work for him full time. And uh, that's kind of how I got into the whole horsemanship deal. You know, Gordon McKinley, his kind of uh, theme in Australia is king of the round pen. Like he sure. could he could get a wild <clears throat> Mustang or you call them Brumbies in Australia. He could get a wild horse, you know, and within 45 minutes have it caught, saddled and almost ready to ride. Like he just was a master at getting wild horses caught and gentle and ready to ride quicker than anybody else. So... Um, uh, I just traveled with him doing clinics and starting colts and problem horses, all that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of how I got into all this. So I kind of left, you know, the kid world and got to be an adult pretty early at 15. So I never went to high school. I never graduated high school, never went to college. I have pretty limited fucking education, let's be honest. Like I can write an email and I just peck at it with my fingers. You know what I mean? So that's <laughs> my level of education. Um, so... Uh, that's how I kind of got into the whole horsemanship deal was through him. And then it kind of, <clears throat> things went from there. Yeah. What, I mean, what was it specifically though about horses? And I mean, cause you picked a very specific thing to do, right? It's like, you, you're kind of, I, I mean, I've thought about this myself and like the, the path that we've taken in our family and you're, you're kind of groomed on a certain path, right? Someone started that like, like my dad, for instance, he started looking at a very specific type of horse to train for the barrels. Mm. It's a, uh, well, you pull a, a, a three-year-old off the track and you yeah. start that, which is somebody else's idea from mm -hmm. a long time ago mm -hmm. and it was somebody mm -hmm. else's. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, you're kind of stuck in this one path. You didn't have that, right? You're that first-generation guy. I, um, I always got off on teaching. I love to work with horses and teach them things. That's what got me off, yeah. okay, is teaching them something. But I was so ignorant and green as a kid I didn't know how to teach him anything and I craved knowledge, but nobody had any. So when I found Gordon, that's where all the light came on of, okay, this is how you can do this. This is how you get a horse that doesn't want to load in a trailer to get it to go in the trailer. Right. This is how you get a horse to drag its ass and slide to a stop. This is, so that whole teaching thing is what appealed to me. You know, back in those days, I had no desire to be a clinician. I had no desire to, to make a lot of money. I was just, I was just a kid that wanted to learn how to teach horses cool shit like stop spin change leads you know what i mean right about that time i saw my first reigning class at the queensland quarter horse championships in comet and uh i just loved how those horses would gallop and stop and turn and spin and roll back and so that that all kind of melted together so what got me off was the whole interaction with a horse and teaching them something and especially in the early years, I work with a lot of problem horses, like bad horses, horses that have been to several other trainers and nobody could fix it. And if we didn't fix it, it was going to be killed, basically. So in the early days, I used to get off on um, the real problem horses and I used to get off on the mind tricks, uh, like for a simple way of explaining it. A horse that doesn't want to load in a trailer. Anybody can drag it in. Anybody could shove it in with a skid steer, okay? But not everybody can get a horse to where... When you start, you know, all the tranquilizers in the world won't get him in. And then an hour later, some bitch is running you down to get in there by himself. That's a mind fuck right there. You get, you, I used to get off on that is how do I get this horse to do what I want, but not only do what I want, but get him to think it's his idea. Yeah. Get him to think that he's outsmarting me. That was the whole thing that got me hot and bothered is getting them to think they're beating me, but they're actually doing exactly what I wanted. You know what I mean? It's a mind trick there. Okay. So that's kind of what got me off into it in the beginning. Um, uh, and, but like I said, I wanted to be a horse trainer. I never had any, any desire to be you a You didn't clinician. even know what it was at that point. No, right? Well, yeah, not particularly. No, not too. particularly. Well, Gordon did a lot of clinics. And another one of my mentors, Ian Francis, did a lot of clinics. Gordon did a lot of cult starting or breaking in clinics and horsemanship clinics. So I was familiar with what that was, but it wasn't really appealing to me to go teach people how to do this. I just did it in the beginning. I just did it because I wanted to learn it. Like when you analyze a lot of people that are successful, most of the time, People didn't start it because they wanted to get rich doing it. They got off on wanting to do it. They like they liked it. They like playing the guitar. They like playing the drums. They like doing something. Yeah, the people and, who chase the money, they never and then make they it. figure out later on. Okay, how do I make this pay? How do I make money from this? You get what I'm trying to say. But initially, what trips their trigger is they like what they're doing. You know, they're passionate about it. And um, and not only that, I think when I finally met Gordon and played around with his 
method and, and ideas for a couple of years, I figured out that I could be really good at this. Like in high school, I was always athletic, but I was always the average kid on the track. You know, I was always came in average. I never won anything, never lost. I was always average at everything in my life. And I think when I found Gordon and his way of training, something clicked in my head is like, I could be actually really good at this. Like this is the one friggin' thing that I could not be average at. If I work hard enough at this, I could be really good at this. You know what I mean? So... Um, it was really just about learning about horsemanship. It wasn't about the money. Like when I went to work for Gordon at age 15, he didn't pay me anything. I lived in a fifth wheel caravan. They gave me food to eat, him and his wife Enid. I lived in the house with their family. Uh, they gave me a place to live, sleep, food on the table, and I worked for free. And I was happy to do it. In fact, I thought I was the luckiest kid in the world, you know, to be able to learn from this guy for free and he wouldn't even charge me. You know what I mean? Um, people laugh and say, well, how could, you know, I worked for him for two years for free, but it wasn't free in my mind. In my mind, he paid, he paid me millions of dollars in knowledge. Like I make millions from what he taught me. Oh, honest to God, I make millions of dollars from the shit that he taught me from 15 to 17, but I did it for free. So in my mind, it wasn't free. He paid me millions to learn it. You know what I mean? It right. was well worth every penny. You couldn't get a kid hardly at all anymore to work for two years for free, for Christ's sake, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Most kids wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? But back then, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a girlfriend. All I wanted to do was sleep, eat, and breathe, horses, horsemanship, learning. Yeah. I mean, and I think you have to like if you look at anything self help or whatever that you always hear that right it's like well it, if you if you do what you love you never work a day in your life mm -hmm. and it sounds real corny when somebody says it doesn't it but i mean it's basically what you just said it it does yeah. but you got to remember at that age i at that age i didn't need money when you're 15 and you don't have a girl you know gordon used to have these funny sayings and one he always used to say to me is is clinton stay away from cars and women till you're 30 you'll be a millionaire and the joke is it's fucking true. Stay away from women and cars till you're 30, you'll have a million dollars, but nobody can do it. So at that age, at 15, I didn't have a girlfriend, didn't even need a car. I didn't need anything. You get what I'm saying? I had food on the table, clothes on my back. I didn't have anything I needed other than knowledge. But very few times, there's only a select window of time in your life where the only thing you have to worry about is fucking learning something. You don't need money. You don't need a car. You don't need, you don't need things. Like when I had a lot of apprentices around for 20 years, I would always tell them, and I'm sure when I told them this, they'd roll their eyes and think I was an idiot. But I always told them, you're in a very, very rare window, lucky window right now. Or I pay you enough to survive. That's it. Just pay you enough to keep food on the table and a roof over your head. But that's all you have to worry about is learning. You don't have to worry about marriage and kids and bills and mortgages and all the other shit that takes up your life. Right now, all you have to do is wake up and learn how to be the best horseman you can be. Now, I always tell them, when you leave my ranch, all oh, those days are over. Now you don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about how you eat, where you're going to sleep, who's paying the mortgage. Now you've got kids, you've got all these other responsibilities in life <clears throat> that do not allow you just to wake up and absorb in your passion. So yeah, you know, the joke is if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. But reality is, reality is this, very few people get to make a lot of money from something they love to do. I, I, I'll be the, you know, here's, I didn't do, be, I wasn't a clinician because I loved it. I did it for the money. I realized there was a lot of money there. I was good at it. I had a natural talent for it. I had a business mind for it and I went for it. It's not like I woke up one day and said, hey, I want to walk with some 65 year old fucking lady in the middle of a field with a gated horse. That didn't turn me on, but it was a business model. So it's like artists. Uh, yeah, artists are some of the goofy some bitches in the world, okay? But most of them, unless they're really famous, don't make any money. It's like musicians. How many of the musicians make millions of dollars at the top? It's like what? 0.1%. How many of the other 99.9% .9 of them are starving? Because often what you love to do doesn't really pay a lot of the bills. Typically, when you really analyze people's jobs, not many people are lucky enough to do something they love doing every day that makes them a damn good living. Most of us do something we love as hobbies and side businesses. Side I mean, this things. is a... this whole industry is built off of that yeah everybody paying for your clinics yeah listening to my show buying horses i've sold generally they're what you would call a weekend warrior right mm -hmm. it's a nurse or whatever yes, they they're doing do something else so to that they can this fund life. this on the that's weekend right. yeah that's right and i was no different i i got into being a clinician for the money of it 
You know what I mean? And I'm not ashamed to say that. Like, it's kind of a <clears> joke. I, I kind of have to laugh. Like, in the whole, I don't class myself as a whole natural horsemanship clinician. I don't use that terminology or, or go along, when I say go along with it, but kind of in that genre. But for lack of a better word, the people that are hardcore natural horsemanship, flat hat, you know, middle of Nevada guys, they almost get off that you're not a true horseman unless you die in the middle of New Mexico in a single wide trailer broke because you did it for the horse. Bullshit. People, people get really attached, though, to whatever they're – like, it's the same thing. It's like you can't wear uh, your hat backwards with cut-off jeans and a pair of sneakers – and be a cowboy at the same time, right? Everybody's got their ideal on what you're supposed that's, to be. That, that's It's like that. you're not a purist if you didn't do it for the horse. You know what I mean? I don't know why it's such a shame there. Like, universities charge money, don't they? You send your kids to university because they get education. Every, the whole world is set up that you pay money, and in return you get education. That's the whole world. Capitalism is set up like that. I want something, whether it's a service or knowledge is a service to some degree. Everything. But it's yeah. funny in the whole natural horsemanship world, it's like a dirty secret that as soon as you make it co a co commercialized or capitalized or you make a lot of money from it, now you're not a purist anymore. You didn't do it for the horse, which I think <clears> is just a crock of shit. You know, I'll, I'll say it. Fuck it. I'll get a lot of shit from it. I don't care. It's like Ray Hunt used to do these clinics and he used to say, I'm not here for the I'm not here for you. I'm here for the horse. I call bullshit on that. It's just I know, a buzzword. I know that'll piss a lot of flat hats off. I don't give a shit. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the horse. Okay, motherfucker. If you're here for the horse, make it free. <laughs> Come on now. Put your money where your mouth is. If you're here really for the horse, instead of charging $1,000 a weekend, charge 100 and have a lot more people show up. Yeah. I don't know where, why, why you can't say, this is what I do for a living. I hope you enjoy it. Here's what I charge. I want to make you feel like you got more than what you paid for. This is a service. I'm going to give you education and knowledge, and in return, you're going to give me money. Why are we going to dance around this whole bullshit that, like I'm here for the horse? I was the first guy to come out and say, yeah, this is what I do for a living. I make money from this. And in return, my theory is, if you pay me $1,000, I want you to feel like you cheated me because you walked away with $1,200. I've always made people feel like they got more than what they paid for. So I always have to laugh about all this shit they go on with about it's just for the horse and blah, blah, blah. If it really was for the horse, make it free. Because if it was free or cheap, guess how many people would show up? Triple. Then let's be honest. If no, you're here absolutely. for the horse and not for the people, make it free. That's why people go to things that don't have cover charges. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, this is, this is, that's what I just think it's a joke. I, I didn't, my biggest fear was dying alone in a single wide horse, in a single wide trailer in the middle of New Mexico, fucking gasping for breath. I don't want to die broke. And, and I'm not ashamed of that. I had a business. I had a business model. I followed it. I sell quality tack. I sell quality information. I sell a service that people want. And in return, I get a profit from that, just like any good business does. You just don't see it. That's, that's the key difference, right? Like, no one's mad at Ford. That's ex for making a lot. Yeah, that's exactly it. Nobody's mad at Ford for making a shit ton of money, but in no. the whole natural horsemanship clicky deal. It, it's just the Western industry as a whole. Yeah, the, Western, the, the Western horse industry is its own worst enemy. I want to shake them. I really do. It's like they, 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 it's like they're allergic to money. Seriously. Like oh, horse really? trainers 20 years ago when I came over here were charging about $1,200 a month to train a horse. 20 years later, you know what a lot of them oh, are charging? $1,200 a month. Give me a break. My first pickup truck when I got a little money over here after a couple of years was $52,000, a brand new Ford loaded. That same truck now, 20 years later, is $85,000, 90000 Yep. So everything's gone up in 20 <clears throat> years, but horse training's still the same price. You know, it's like yearlings. You could buy a really good yearling 20 years ago at the cow horse or cutting sales between 25 and 50. Guess what? As a general rule, 20 years later, as a good rule of thumb, you can still buy a great yearling between 25 and 50. Hay's going up. Diesel's going up. Trucks have gone up. Tax going up. Everything goes up, but it's like the Western industry is stuck in this old 30 years ago mentality. Yeah, and I we, mean, we saw that with um, Fallon where she talked about payouts not changing in like San Antonio. And over two decades, too. Yeah, but so it, it's it's a really simple thing, right? The, the reason everything's down is because people aren't investing in it enough. You have done that, right? So you're able to kind of look through this, like this, you're past the veil, right? You're like, you see it for what it is. Mm -hmm. Some of us do, right? Like some of us who left it, like for me personally, I quit rodeoing and breaking colts and riding because 
Yeah, I wasn't making any money. You didn't money. want to be broke. No, so I started a business, a real business that makes real money. Yes. Now I can do this and not care That's at, exactly at my right. age. But I, there's some of my great friends, their life sucks ass. Yes. But they're doing it for the horse. It's great. If you're driving a 40-year-old pickup truck and you, you live in other oh, people's oh, trailers, Oh, the opposite is if you're like a lot of horse trainers, you're driving a $100,000 pickup truck and you're up to your eyeballs and, be, be, and debt. Or you convince somebody else to finance That's what I laugh you. about. You go to the rain and fertility, and if you're a young kid walking into the rain and fertility, you go out in the parking lot and there's $500,000 trucks and trailers and rigs everywhere. Oh, yeah. You'd think, oh, my God, there's millions in this business. Psst, what you don't know is 90% of them are up to their eyeballs and debt. They're all trying to keep up with the Joneses. They're all yep. trying to keep up. That's one thing I loved about Bob Loomis. Bob Loomis is a famous guy in the reigning world and bred phenomenal horses. And, you know, he'd show up to a horse show with a pretty damn modest 25-year-old Sooner trailer. Yeah. But he'd unload a million and a half dollars worth of horses out of it. Yeah. Well, other guys will show up to the horse, horse show with a $350,000 rig and, and unload a $40,000 donkey at the back of it. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Like, oh, Lo Loomis got it. He he knew his value was in horse flesh and what he could sell and having the best horses. He didn't have to have the best truck, the best trailer. If you went to Loomis's old ranch that he had, it was very modest, almost a little bit run down even. Yeah. But I sure as shit know that, that when he was in his peak, you went there for the very best horses. So you might walk out of there with a five hundred thousand dollar three-year-old you know what yeah. i mean so so there's there's a there's a lot of smoke and mirrors when it comes to the horse industry a lot is that you'd think there's a lot of money in it but in reality most people up to their eyeballs in debt you know yeah brent wright's another great rein and horse trainer and when he was in his peak you know he'd show up to a horse trailer a horse show with a pretty modest damn horse trailer and a, and a modest truck with two hundred thousand miles on it but he sure as shit be in the first two or three in the frame fraternity too because yep. he left he lived a very modest lifestyle and I bet he kept, I don't know for sure, but if I had to be a betting man, I bet he kept a hell of a lot of the money that he made because he didn't piss it away on things. That's, I mean, it's the most, fr you're like striking a nerve on me because there's people that I really have looked up to a lot in the horse world, great horsemen, great, uh, great, call them what, you know, what you want to mm -hmm. call them. And, and you see all this stuff kind of deteriorate over the years as they move past, like kind of maybe the prime in their career. It's sad. It's horrifying, right? Yes. Because it, it's like, it's like when you, if you were a boxing fan and you saw Mike Tyson go broke and go to prison, that cripples you, right? Mm -hmm. like, oh, wow. If that could happen to him, like what, yep. what hope is there in the world? Well, it's just like that in the Western world. It's just not world famous. It's mm -hmm. subculture oh, famous. Yeah. And, and you'll see these people and, and it always turned me off of making a career out of training horses. Because that's all my family does, other than me. Yeah. And uh, at least for money. Yes. Right? And you see these ups and these downs and these peaks and these valleys. And if you were a kid, like I grew up living that feast or famine life, that is, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to raise kids in that sometimes if, if they do it, if you do it the wrong way. Well, so your body, you're when you're a horse trainer, everything. it's a body. And the other problem I realized with being a horse trainer is your body is your greatest asset. Mm -hmm. It's like a, you know, sports stars the same way, a basketball player, except he's getting paid millions a year. So if he blows his knee out, knee out on year three, he's probably pocketed 20 million in his contract. Horse trainer, you blow your disc out in your back, you rip your pelvis apart, you're screwed. So anytime your body is your greatest asset, that's a bad business to be in. See me, I, as long as I could move, not some, I'm retired now, but when before I got retired, theoretically, as long as I could move my lips, I could make money. Right. You know, Gordon McKinley told me this when I was 13 years old, and I never forgot it, okay? He always, he said to me this one time, and I stuck with me my whole life. He said, Clinton, there's not enough hours in the day and with your own two hands to get rich. I'll say it again. There's not enough hours in the day and with your own two hands to get rich. Not unless you're a gold maker or sculptor, unless you do some freaky shit that nobody else in the world can do. You can't get rich with your own two hands. You have to figure out how to duplicate yourself. So that's what, you know, I made three VHS tapes, you know, over 20 years ago with a local television station. They're pretty embarrassing now. I'm actually going to put them out on my <laughs> app just for fun to kind of make fun of myself and poke fun and just look back on it. But I realized early you have to be able to duplicate yourself. A farmer duplicates himself. A farmer puts a seed in the ground. It grows. He grabs money, for, grows a, a husk of corn. He makes money from that. Well, you plant more corn. So you've got to be in a business that you're duplicating yourself if you want to get rich. If you don't want to get rich, is that me or you? Not me, yeah. Must be me. Sorry about that. Um, 
if you want to get rich, you can't be in a service business. And that's what horse training is. It's a service business. Now, for example, you know, we have an academy horse program, which is basically you bring me a horse for six weeks whether it's a cult to be started, a problem horse, or, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, just needs more education, we'll ride it for six weeks. But we charge you $6,000 yeah. plus $25 a day board. So now now horse trainers hear that and they get pissed off about how the fuck do you get $6,000 for six weeks? It's called marketing, motherfucker. That's what it's called. It's because I spend a million dollars a year on marketing. What do you spend on marketing? So why do I it get? Doesn't exist. Why do I get? Why do I get six grand in, for six weeks of training, and most horse trainers get twelve? Because I invest back in myself. I built a brand for twenty something years. Plus, those horses, one student walks three horses or four horses a day, so they spend two and a half hours a day on each horse. You know how much horses get in training at a regular training barn? Maybe thirty minutes, forty five at that best. Because it's a numbers game. The trainer's trying to survive. He's got 40 well, it's horses. it's volume-based It's selling. volume. He's got... Yeah. So I, when everybody else is running, I want to walk. I re get, figured that out very quickly, that the horse training game is a volume deal. If everybody else is doing volume, I want to do quality and not quantity. So do the opposite. If everybody's running, I want to walk. If everybody starts walking, I start fucking running. I've always been like that. I do the opposite of what the rest of the world's mm -hmm. doing, and typically you'll be in good shape. So... So now at $6,000 for six weeks training, you could make some money. It works out to be about 60 bucks an hour. That ain't bad money, $60 an hour to train a horse. Not long, See, the right? English world, they've got it figured out how to make money. Hunter jumpers, they're making five, $6,000 a month to keep a horse in training. The English world have figured out how to make money from training horses. The Western world, we're just a bunch of fucking rednecks running around trying to slit each other's throats where we should be coming together as a group and saying, okay, let's raise these prices. Come on, guys. Let's, instead of fighting against each other, let's get together. Let's raise these prices. Well, but they it, it, won't it raises do it. everybody up because then everybody, even if you're paying more, but you're also making more. Yes, you're making, but you can pay better help. You can get better services, etc. So, you know, I get frustrated because a lot of people in the horse industry barely make a living. Few people get rich and few people get retired. It's that simple. Now, it could be a lot better. More people make money, but they're just stuck in a mentality where they're frightened to death to go up in their prices because what happens if three people leave? I always say it's easier to go broke not, not working so hard. <laughs> You can go broke working really hard or go broke not working real hard. Well, if three people leave, you didn't need them anyway. Yep. If you got 15 horses in training and you raise your prices, you know, four five hundred dollars a month, and half of them leave, you're still making more money and doing a better job on the seven that stayed. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people right now in this crazy time we're living in who are selling, like, take it to sales, mm -hmm. trucks, uh, trailers, whatever. They're selling a quarter of what they used to because well, they just can't get them. Yeah, but they're making more money than they've ever made. Supply and demand. Yep. When people always want what they can't have. I'll give you a perfect story about this, okay? Um, so when I left, I worked for Gordon McClendon, one of my mentors for two years, and another guy called Ian Francis, another one of my mentors in Australia for a year. And both of, in my opinion, the world's best horsemen. And I never take credit for I invented what I do. I took it from those two guys. Those guys gave me the knowledge. All I did is rearrange it, make it structured for people that don't know how to ride, <clears throat> and market it. So I'll take credit for that. But I never ever take credit for it was my ideas of the actual horse training. That was their ideas. Now, both of them had unique skill set that the other one didn't have. You know, Gordon could do things that Ian couldn't do, and Ian could do things that Gordon couldn't do, and vice versa. So I just blended two legends together, called it down under horsemanship, and then I put it together in a teachable program for people all over the world that could learn. So I'll take credit for that part of it, okay? Um, but... Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought there. What, what were we saying about... Um, you were telling me a story. Yeah. Oh, shit. It'll come back to me here in a second. Yeah, it was getting really good, too. I'm Fuck a little it disappointed. Was good. Yeah. What was it, huh? Oh, that's right. That is my partner, Kristen. She, she knew what she, you were going to say before what you said it. I'm fucking say before yeah. I say it. That, that's why she's over there. That's just why she's over there. She's like, I've heard this yes. shit before. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. She's over there. Yeah. So here's the thing. When I left Gordon and Ian... It's not like in America, like the horse industry in Australia is pretty poor compared to Austra uh, to America, okay? Yeah, so a lot less people. A lot less it? people. We've got fucking 30 million people in the whole country. you got more and live in California than we do in our whole country. You could let a, a machine gun go off in the middle of Australia and not hit any motherfucker. You know what I mean? You know, that's, it's funny. I always joke about it. Australia has some of the strictest gun laws. Who the fuck are you going to shoot? Nobody lives there. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's 30 million people in the entire country. We yeah. have a continent almost as big as North America. You know, and so I kind of find that amusing. But anyway... 
So here in America, if you work for a very successful guy, like my academy students, they come to me for the academy, they graduate. They can make a damn good living off my name. Does that make sense? You're a Clinton Anderson certified clinician. So it's like a franchise. So I franchise it. They pay me a franchise fee every year, but they use my name, my likeliness, my system. I do all their advertising. I do all their promotion. All they have to do is do the horse. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a horse training snow cone. So in Australia, you didn't, it it doesn't really exist back there. So even though I worked for the country's best two horsemen, when I went out my own, I was on my own. So I didn't have any residual income. I didn't have any built-in customers, etc. So I put an ad in the local paper, you know, um, Clinton Anderson, you know, we call it breaking in Australia, but cult starting, re-educating, which is like problem horses, float training, which is like trailering problem horses. Like I, you know, back in the early days, I shot horses to make money. I did anything. I'm starving. I just need to eat. Yep. Okay. So I didn't care what kind of piece of shit horse you showed up with, how bad it was trained, how big a killer it was. I smiled and took it on and said, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. So I put an ad in the local paper looking for business. I'd go out my own. Well, I get a bunch of people calling. So I'd go through the whole speech. You know, my name's Clinton Anderson. This is what I do. And this is how I do it. And I give them this whole 30 minute good speech. And then finally, I think I've got them on the hook and they'll say, okay, well, um, when can I, you know, what do you charge? And I tell them and I, they say, well, when, when can I bring my horse? You can bring it right now. I'm ready, ready to go. Drop it off tomorrow. Drop it off today. And you could just hear this fucking silence in their voice a little, in their head. Like you could just tell something didn't sit right with them. And then they'd say, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Well, they never call me back. And, I, and this happened every day for two weeks. I couldn't get one person to send me a fucking horse for training. Not one. Well, after two weeks, I said, okay, you keep doing the same thing, Clinton. You're going to keep getting the same thing. So here's how I changed the speech. Same speech as I went through, but here's what I changed at the end. When they'd say, well, when can I bring my horse? Listen, Barry, I'm, I'm full up. I, I don't have an opening for four months. I've honest to God, I'm booked full. But I tell you what, I've really enjoyed this conversation we've had together here. I've got a lady that's supposed to drop a colt off next Monday, but she called a couple of days ago and said her husband might have to have a hernia operation and she may not be able to bring a horse. Listen, if you promise not to tell anybody, I'll give you that slot. I've really enjoyed chatting with you, but you can't tell anybody body because if if, if word gets out that I gave you this slot and other people had to wait four months to get in here they're going to be pissed off at me no 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 Clinton I won't say a word I won't say a word let me know what she says okay mate I'll give her a call and find out okay so I'd hang up I'd go do some laundry fucking ride a horse do some dumb shit I'd call them back two hours later and say listen she did say she's not going to bring that cult so if you want that slot I'll give it to you but again if you don't want it you know I've gotten somebody else that'll come immediately no 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 I want it I want it I had a train Training full of barn full of training horses within three days. Sure, I fucking lied, but people want what they can't have. Yeah, it's scarcity mentality. You want to go to a restaurant that has a line, a wait. 15 minutes, 20. You don't want to go to a restaurant that has a three hour waiting line, but you sure as shit don't want to go to a restaurant where you walk in there and you look around and it's like, hey, no motherfuckers are here. Is the food bad here? Is somebody shit in the sink? Like, why is nobody sitting in this restaurant? This, that, so you always have to have a now. Once you, now, obviously, once I got a barn full of horses, I could give the same speech, and it wasn't a lie. Does that make sense? That's called marketing. That's called salesmanship. Does that make sense? So once I got busy, it was the same speech, and it wasn't a white lie at that point. But when I told people the truth, which is yes, I have a slot right now. I'm ready to take your horse. I was eager to do a good job. I wanted to do a good job. Eh, they started backpedaling. People want what they can't have. You know, oh, everybody thinks everybody everything. thinks the grass is fucking greener on the other side of the fence till you get over there and figure out the motherfucker's brown. You know what I mean? So that's the that's there's a lot to do with business about how you. There's always more money in quantity, not qual, uh, quality. Sorry, not quantity. You know, so the problem with the horse training industry in general, I don't give a shit what. Now English is different. Those motherfuckers have actually figured out how to make money from this, but in the Western industry. They're trying to do a volume-based business rather than quality. Did you ever see the movie Ford vs. Ferrari? I didn't see it. Okay, you need to fucking see that movie. It's a travesty, a phenomenal movie. And the general gist is Ford made billions by a production line. Okay, and, and but their cars in this movie were nowhere near the quality of Ferrari. Ferrari made the best race cars in the world, 
but they went fucking broke doing it because you couldn't make a profit because it was a hands-on, one guy built the engine, one guy built the body, one guy built the transmission, one guy did the tires. It was such a hands-on intense business that Ferrari went broke because they couldn't do volume. When I got done watching that movie, I said to Kristen, I said, this is a, this is, horse training is like Ferrari and Ford. I want to be the Ferrari model. There's no money in it, but I want to build quality. I want quality animals. When you're trying to train horses on a production line, the quality hits the bottom of the floor. They, they're an animal. It's like a hand painting. You have to paint that son of a bitch by hand. You just can't throw some paint on the wall and have it stick and make it be a Picasso. Well, and then a horse can be undone faster than anything, too. So, so. it's just, a, you know, horse training is, is they're trying to make money on a volume basis when it needs to be treated like a quality basis. You know, so the horse trainers need to get together and say, okay, guys, let's raise our prices as an industry. Let's get it up there, another 25 50%. People will pay it. They're just frightened to death that they won't. They're all frightened to death if they raise their prices $100. Owners are going to say, I'm not going to, um, I've heard this before. Well, Clinton, I can't raise my prices to $250 because somebody will leave. And I'll say, listen, if somebody takes a horse out of training with you because you raise $250 a month, do you really fucking need them as a customer? Seriously. Or want them. Are yeah. they really going to mount you on the kind of horses you need to be mounted to win? If they're going to nickel and dime you over 250 bucks, do you really want them as a customer? And we all know the answer. Fucking no. Now, I didn't say like triple it in one day, but get the prices up there to where everybody can make a good living. You know, the horse trainers are starving to make a living. They're, that's why they're fighting, you know, fighting, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. You know, that's why they're undercutting each other. Instead of undercutting each other, group together. Come on, let's raise the prices. Every time I've raised prices, I got more customers. I didn't get less. I got more customers every single time I raised prices. Yeah. I and mean, people there's, get there's pissed at me be for it. <laughs> there's always going to be an association with the more expensive. I mean, there's a reason people buy Ferraris or buy Rolexes or whatever, whatever the yeah. luxury item is. You're, immediately, your brain is going to click, well, yeah, the Rolex costs 100 times what the Timex costs. Or a hundred thousand times, really. Yeah. Let's be real, but uh, it's quality. Yes, yeah, everything's quality. There is. A, here's the funny thing about America: there is enough wealthy people in America that people really will pay for quality. They really will. In Australia, I don't think I could say that. A lot of middle middle class in Australia. <clears throat> not a lot of rich people in Australia. Not a lot of poor people. A lot of middle class. What's the number one industry in Australia? I wouldn't even fuck. Know. I wouldn't even know anymore. Survival. Dr you know. You know. Australians are really good at drinking, fu fighting, and fucking. That's no. what we're real good at. Okay. So not so, great at the latter. You don't have very many people. <laughs> That's exactly <Yeah>. right. <laughs> so you know, Australia's got a lot high cost of living. It's like Hawaii. We're like an island. We yeah. export a lot of beef. We export a lot of coal, minerals. And that's about it. You know, everything else is like Hawaii. It's imported. Cars are imported. You know, clothing's imported. Everything's imported. So pr cost of living in Australia is quite high. Yeah, what, uh, Australia, Australia's, I almost said it like you, Australia's uh, most famous car is just a Chevy with a different badge, right? Pretty much, the Holden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Holden. And I don't even know if they make them anymore in Australia. Really? I don't know. I, I I heard they were cutting production years ago, and they still might be making yeah, them. You don't right. go back much then, huh? I go back every couple of years just to see my parents and direct family. But I would, if I ever stopped doing horses and went back to Australia, I would never do horses over there. I'm too spoiled now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty humbling when you go back to Australia and see the horse industry over there compared to what it is here that's why i came to america i left australia when i was 21 years old went to america i had 400 dollars in my pocket and a pair of boots and a bridle and this is where if you wanted to be number one this is where you had to go this is where you had to be if you want to be the best in the world or whatever the fuck you're doing america at least for the horse industry and for a lot of other industries i'm sure too is the place you needed to be so that's where i went to do it so oh, i mean it's almost everything a lot of things you know yeah. it, it, a lot of people, you know, I'm big into politics and shit, and, and I fucking hate these people that run down America and run down the flag and run down everything. Motherfucker, go live in another country. You pricks do not know how good you've got it. I went to the Middle East. I'll tell you a fucking funny story. I was drunk at a party one time, which is not unusual, and some motherfucker says, hey, let's go to Egypt, and we'll fucking have a vacation in the Middle East. Well, when I'm drunk, everything looks like a good idea. If you said, let's walk up Mount Everest backwards naked, I'd say, fuck yeah, that'll be a challenge. When I sober up, I kind of regret some of the shit I did. 
So I already committed <laughs> to this fucking vacation. So I, go, I spent $30,000 and go to a vacation like 12 years ago. In, in Egypt. The, in, in, in the Middle East, all oh. through the Middle East. Egypt, Jordan, Israel, all those places over there. Like a European backpack without yeah. Amsterdam and yeah. all the fun and, stuff. And, and, and it was a shithole. Let me just tell you what it is, a shithole. We went with an armored guard. I went with like three other couples and we had an armored guard with us. Thank fuck for that too. I, I mean, I was so thankful. I got back to America and just kissed the ground when I got off the plane. You know, people people think, you know, I'm not saying America's perfect, but it's a sure lot better than a lot of other places in the fucking world. These people that run America down, they need to really go live in a shithole country for a few years. Or not, they wouldn't even last a few years. They'd last a week and they'd be begging their ass to get back to capital, capitalism USA again. We have the greatest country in the world and Australia is a close second. You know what I mean? So uh, it was just, it was it was a miserable fucking vacation. I put on like 15 pounds because all I ate was candy bars the whole time because <laughs> they're eating fucking calf, they're eating calf eyeballs and fish nuts and weirdest <laughs> shit in the world over there. I just want to throw up every time I walked into a restaurant. So well, do you at least have a photo album you could show? Oh, I got a photo album, but, <laughs> it, you know, but I'm just telling you, people just don't realize how good a lot of people do not realize just how good America really is. And when I, even me a little bit, when I go back to Australia every couple of years, it's kind of humbling for me to see, I, I kind of appreciate even getting back here. It's like, man, I got a good gig going on here. And uh, it just when, when you're raised here, you don't sometimes realize that because you don't realize how shitty it is in some other countries. Yeah, I mean, how shitty life has been just for every human up until like the modern world. Mm-hmm horrible mm -hmm. like we wouldn't be having conversations about training horses like we would probably have to eat our horses yes you know what i mean i mean because <laughs> life's just it, life has never been like this pursuit of your pleasures and your happiness until like now yeah we're living and in the it's greatest all about time. survival and it is in other places in the world too those places you were at like they yeah. don't you think they give a crap about making horse dvds no they just want to be alive they want to eat yeah, they and, want and to they survive want somebody not to come kill them for their mask falling down that's exactly right <laughs> of course i don't know we might be close to that here from some um, of the tweets it's gonna get bad again it i mean it seems like it might but yeah it's it is interesting you just nobody understands and, and you get a better i don't want to say you get a better quality person in the western type industry but you get a harder working person oh, very much a, so no a i'm better not... ideal than you yeah. do like your like if you got a group of 100 baristas and 100 horse trainers you know, horse trainers probably gonna be yeah. a little bit better but you know when i criticize the the, the western industry i'm not cr criticizing the culture or the people meaning that they, they work hard they're good intended they're they're hard working salt of the earth people i just get frustrated because they're working 80 hour weeks and not making any money yeah it's just an audit. i get i get frustrated because they could retire at a decent age and not be crippled but they but they they won't I get frustrated because I want to shake them and say, let me fucking take care of your business model, will you? You just go train the horse and let me do the rest of it and I'll figure this shit out for you. They're their own. It's like I said, they're allergic to money. It's like they don't like money. I'll be admit, Gordon McKinley was the same way. He's the greatest man I've ever known. He wasn't a great businessman. He gave too much shit away. Gordon's famous line was, it's all right, you don't need to pay me for the shoe. And it's all right, you don't need to pay me for the... He was always everybody's good old boy. But it cost him a lot financially. Ian was different. Ian built for everything. Now, Ian, again, you can build for everything. Just my whole theory is if you charge somebody $100, I want them to walk away thinking they got 130 of value. I don't care if you charge them a million dollars. They better think they got a million one in value. As long as whatever you charge them, they walk away feeling like they got more than they paid for. You did exactly what you needed to do. And that's the rule right there. Now, if you charge them 100 and they feel like they got $80, $90 worth of value out of you. They're pissed off. That's pretty common, unfortunately, it with is. horse trainers, too. Because if, if you're not one of those overbearing horse people and you don't check up on your horse and you send them to the wrong person, you, you find out yeah. out of those six days a week they told you they were riding your horse, yeah, maybe two. Yeah. you know, And then your horse comes back looking like absolute shit. Absolutely. That's you a ask lot it, of what You happens. ask any trainer. Yeah. And I put horses in training over the years when I was in – on the road a lot i used to have to put horses in training because i still like to see him show well any trainer that ever worked for me they know i was a pain in their ass i checked every bill i checked every invoice i went and saw the horses i got on a plane and went and saw them every six weeks i talked to the assistants they knew they couldn't fuck with me because i was going to look up their skirt but yeah a lot of people just write a check and don't go check up you know and that can be a problem as well guys let me remind you how much we love pendleton whiskey and how much you'll love it too Here's the thing with Pendleton. 
It's not on every single shelf in the entire country. Sometimes you go to those small towns where the small rodeos are and you can't find Pendleton. That's where drizzly.com comes into play. Satisfy your inner cowboy by purchasing your bottle of Pendleton whiskey online. Buy it online at drizzly.com. Put it in the trailer. Pendleton blended Canadian whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Pendleton Distilleries, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And please drink responsibly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really tricky... That's what I really find fascinating, other than the fact that you're, you're blunt and you'll just say it as it is, which is a thing that we desperately need. People are but, attracted to genuine and authentic people. That's what... And, and now, people either love me or hate me. I get it. I'm real polarizing. And I'm okay with that. There's lots of people that hate my fucking guts. And I'm not mad about it. Don't get upset. Because I say, good luck. There's somebody else out there you will like. Other people like me the way I am. But... but you can't please everybody. So I quit trying years ago, many years ago, to try to please everybody. Because the more you try to please everybody, the more pissed off everybody gets. And the more unhappy you are because of it. Yeah, so you might as well just be who you are and let it fall where it falls. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, when was it, like, exactly? Because you are one of the rarities in this industry who actually made, like, a successful life out of it that you can retire off of and have something left at the end besides just what a couple memories of some colts that maybe mm-hmm. you had mm-hmm. or a stud that you tried to keep but you couldn't or whatever it is i mean there's a hundred different stories that you could fit any freaking bobblehead who was a horse trainer on but when was it like in your career that you're like hold on i actually understand how this can be successful i see everything that was done incorrectly and then you found a way to market yourself market a product which is training horses and make it accessible to a lot of people and make it desired by a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's no small thing. People have done it with other things, but not a lot of people have done it with horse training. I think I figured out going back to what Gordon McKinley told me is there's not enough hours and with your own two hands to get rich. So you can only train so many horses in a day before you're exhausted and you got to go to bed. And there's only so many hours in a day that you can do it and, and still sleep. So I, it didn't take me more than <clears throat> three or four years to figure out that training horses itself was not a good business model to make money, okay? However, when I was young, usually you're stupid when you're young, and when I came to America, I still had a passion for reining. I wanted to be a reining horse trainer. Well, I figured out that unless you were the assistant trainer of one of you know, the top two or three guys in the country, by the time he picked what he wanted to show, and the second assistant got what he wanted to show, there was nothing left for anybody else. So if you weren't working for one of those one or two top guys or three guys, you were just going to be slave labor again. That's all it really was. So so what ended up happening is is I actually got fired from a job, which really actually what spied down under horsemanship. Um, you know, we joke about it, but I was working for Mike and Bobby Boyle in Ion, California, and I, I like him to death, and, and Bobby fired me. And we joke about it now together, but it was the greatest fire I ever had because it kind of forced me to do Down Under because I was broke, I got fired. Um, uh, we, we clashed on how to train horses. That's really what it came down to. And we laugh about it now. I had a certain way I wanted to train horses. They wanted a certain way. And, and neither one of us are right or wrong. It's just different. But at the same time, i got to fucking eat. So I realized, I, I see, back in Australia, I did a lot of lessons and did a lot of um, clinics just through pure necessity, meaning that, okay, I wanted to train horses. I like training horses. And so you would send me a colt to train. You'd come to pick it up in six weeks. So I'd ride it for you, show you everything it knows, let you ride it, give you a little lesson on it, etc. The whole thing might last two hours. And at the end of the two hours, the lady would say to me, well, Clinton, I've had a great time, but I can't remember everything you've told me. I really like what you've done. Can I bring the horse back for a lesson once a week and you show me more of the buttons you put on him? And I'm fucking desperate for money. Sure, 30 bucks, come back, 30 bucks an hour. Come on back and I'll give you a lesson. So she'd bring a horse back for a few lessons. Then after a few weeks, she'd say, listen, my girlfriend wants to come with me for a lesson. Can she bring her horse? Sure, 30 bucks, come on back. Well, pretty soon then two or three ladies would say, listen, all my friends want to do this, but instead of us coming to you, will you come to us? Which is kind of like the start of a little clinic. We've got six ladies, come to our barn, and you teach us all for the weekend. So what happened was the teaching side of my business took off. Much, you know, people wanted me to teach rather than train. It wasn't like I woke up and necessarily said I want to teach because at that time I realized there was more money. Back then in Australia, this is when I'm still in Australia, I'm still trying to eat. 
You know what I mean? So I'm going with yeah, whatever's paying. Base survival. I'm yeah. pe- I'm thinking whatever fucking pays is what I'm doing. Like if you showed up with a 15 year old wild Mustang Brumby that's killed three trainers and said, "Would you train it?" I'd say, "Thank you so much for showing up here, sir. Appreciate it." Who wants to fucking train that horse? Nobody. But I was broke. I was hungry. I needed that money. So I said, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, sir. Come back in six weeks. And I sure as shit, I had that son of a bitch broke to death too. Now, it half killed me. I might have to spend six hours a day to get it done. But I got the job done. I didn't, you know, back in Australia, when you're a horse trainer, you don't get to pick and choose what comes in the door until you get real successful. In the early years, you're just thankful that some asshole showed up and is willing to pay you. It's a whole different mentality to here. Over here, it's a, it, you have a whole bunch of horses that need trained and a lot less people that can train them. In Australia, it's almost like there was, at least 20 years ago, there was a lot more horse trainers than what there were people that wanted to send horses. Does that right. make sense? No, it does. So yeah. a long-term horse in Australia was a six-week program. There was none of this leave it here for, a, you know, two or three years in training. It was like six weeks and it's gone. So the horse, the, the teaching part of my business took off. And the horse training got smaller and smaller and smaller. So really, I kind of became a clinician through just necessity. I did lessons in clinics and so forth. When I came to America, I wanted to go back to being a horse trainer. Well, when I got fired from that job, I needed money. So what was I good at? I was good at teaching. I went back to teaching. I didn't expect to do it for a year or two, make some money, get back into the horse game again and be a reigning horse trainer. Well, it's kind of like crack cocaine. That motherfucker, I got addicted to the money. You know, two years into it, I'm grossing 300000 a year. You know what I mean? So, fuck, I can't go back to being a horse trainer now and making 20000 a year. So I stayed with it. And then I stayed on this, this, this fucking merry-go-round for 20-something years, and I finally got off it, you know, two years ago I retired. You know what I mean? So now, I'm, now what I am now is a horse trainer, so to speak, meaning that I, I don't do it. There's no money in it, of course, but I do, that's what I do every day. I'm retired, but I want to train horses. I've gone back to doing what I wanted to do over 20 years ago, which is train horses. Now, I only ride seven a day. It's not hard at all. I get to the barn at eight, leave at three. It's not, I'm not working hard enough to be real successful at it, but I'm doing it because I enjoy it and I want to do it. So, so to answer your question about how to get out and figure out this money in teaching, I just kind of did it in the beginning through necessity, when I got fired from that job, once I got, once I realized there was, I always knew though, I suppose there was more money in it. Um, uh, but it's, I just kind of took off from there. And then, and then, you know, I just got bigger into it and bigger into it. And probably what I underestimated was if you would have told me 20 something years ago, what it would have taken to get retired at 43, like I did, I probably wouldn't have done it, just to be perfectly honest with you. There was a whole lot of old lady dick sucking that went on in my career. I mean, I fucking took it up the ass a lot for many fucking years. I've seen thousands of women crying and sobbing and listening to their fucking stories and putting up with their bullshit. I was their pool boy for 20 fucking years, did whatever the fuck they wanted. So a lot of people resent me because of the money I made in the horse industry. A lot of people get pissed at me and are jealous of me and fuck Clinton Anderson. He just got on TV and made all this money. Bullshit. I got on my knees a lot and sucked a lot of old lady dick to get that money. Make no <laughs> doubt about that. When you're out in the middle of a fucking cow field helping some lady with a 16 hand hard Tennessee walker but wants to learn how to change leads on it, you want to blow your fucking brains out. Okay. So I it would, what I underestimated is is how long I'd be on that merry-go-round. Because what happened was is I got into a lot of debt be, through growing the business that once I'm six, seven million in debt, I just can't quit one day and say, fuck it, I don't want to do this no more. Yep. So you got to stay on the hamster wheel and hope to God there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And there was, but sometimes it was hard to see that when you're in the thick of it. You know what I mean? So I made money from selling information, not selling a service. Okay, so so this cup, for example, I'm drinking out. I can only mark this cup up so long before you say, fuck it, I'm not paying that much for a Yeti cup. But if I can tell you, what about if I could teach you how to make this Yeti cup? How much would you pay for it then? If I could teach you how to go home and make your own Yeti cups. And your answer would be, well, how valuable is that information? That's fucking marketing. That's my job again. My job is to make this Yeti cup seem like it's a $100,000 cup. So if I can convince you it's worth 100000 for me to teach you the knowledge how to drink out of this Yeti cup and use this Yeti cup, you'll pay it. That's where marketing comes in. You can only mark up a service, and horse training is a service, so much before people say, fuck it, I'm done. I'm not spending any more money. But information is a perceived value. 
When I came to America, I used to charge $400 a day. If you wanted to hire me, you could char- you could get me for the whole day to work at your barn, do whatever horse training you wanted for $400 a day. I charged $10,000 a day for the same information. Nothing's changed, honest to God, in 20 years as far as what I'm going to do with your horse, except 20 years of marketing gets me $10,000 a day as opposed to $400. Does that make sense? Oh, it's absolutely. perceived value is what I grew from 20 years ago to now. That's marketing. Yeah, a lot of people get pissed at me for it, but that's the truth to it. Yeah, I mean, but this is, I mean, there's so many models, and I'm sure you looked at other models to kind of develop your own, but there's plenty of models out there that can show you exactly how to do that. It's just, I don't know if it's a lack of brain power. Like, you maybe you didn't graduate high school or go to college, but you're a smart guy, right? Some people are just born intelligent. I've other had the gift aren't. of the gab. I've always had the gift of the gab, <clears throat> and I've always had a flair for making money. I've always made money, even from a kid, paper routes, m- mowing lawns. You know, all kinds of shit. I just, I got off on making money. Uh, the re- you know really why I got, got off on making money is it's kind of stupid, but it's the truth. Like in Australia, like I said, there's a lot of middle income people. Not a lot of rich people, not a lot of poor people, okay? So, you know, me and my sister, for your birthday or Christmas, you might get one nice present and then fucking socks and underwear after that. You know, everybody gives you socks and underwear for presents, which as a kid fucking sucks. You know <laughs> what I mean? Worst, you want yeah. the toy, but you get socks and underwear. So when I was a kid, when I fucking figured out Santa was full of shit and he didn't really exist and and that's all bullshit and Easter Bunny too, fuck him. When I figured out that shit and I could actually make my own money, when I figured out when I made my own money, I could buy my own radio controlled car, I could buy my own skateboard, I could buy my own BMX bike. When I figured out, that was probably about seven, eight years old, when I figured out that I could actually go make money and buy cool shit, Oh, motherfucker, game on at that point. You know what I mean? And my parents always said, you know, short of buying nunchucks and a fucking ninja star, I could buy whatever the hell I wanted as a kid. (laughs) Okay, so I was mowing lawns. I was washing windows. I was paper routes. I was doing anything to make money. And the real reason I like making money, because I like fun toys. What kid doesn't like fun toys? But, but I distinctively went to my dad. This is when it happened. On, on all jokes aside, I probably was around seven or eight. I don't know exactly. But I went to my dad and I wanted him to buy me this cool fucking radio control car as a kid. And my dad looked at me and said, no, I'm not buying it for you. He said, go make some money and buy it yourself. Well, he probably just said it kind of flippantly. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, go fucking make some money and buy it yourself. And I was like, ah, oh, you mean I can actually get my own shit now? Oh, it was on then. Light bulb went Light off. Light bulb went off. Clinton Anderson got on money. some crack, and I got after it after that. <laughs> now, I was always broke. I never saved any of my money as a kid. I blew it on all kinds of stupid toys and shit. My sister saved. My sister still got the same fucking dollar she got when she was 10, okay, from her birthday. I blew all my money as a kid, but I earned my own money. So that was what got me triggered on making money is I like to buy my own shit because it was control for me and I didn't have to go back to my parents and ask them for shit and I didn't have to rely on fucking Santa or the Easter Bunny. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great way to put it. Yeah, it's and that's another lesson. It's, the less to be parents buy this. their kids, the fucking better these little pricks are going to be. It's that simple. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, that's people, another people lesson laugh that needs to be brought you into this industry. You don't have kids, Clinton. What the fuck would you know? True, I don't have kids, but I sure as shit raised a lot of your motherfuckers' kids. <laughs> I've sure as shit been on the back end of your fucking parenting, and I can tell you this: with 20 years of training kids through the academy, the kids that come in broke that had three jobs to pay for the academy after school usually worked three times as hard than the little prick that comes from wealthy parents that their grandparents or their mother or father paid for the academy. That I can tell you for sure. Not always. I'm not going to say always, okay? But as a general rule, the kids that came in from poor backgrounds typically worked well and harder and did much better job than kids that come from money. So, so as a parent, give them love, give them support, give them roof over their head and education. Beyond that, fuck them. Let them get their own shit together. You know, that's yeah. every, every parent wants to save their kid from the struggles of life. Let me tell you, it's the struggles that make them successful. It's those struggles that make them great humans. That's the trick to the whole deal. Like there's a, there's a when, where I grew up with Gordon in Rockhampton, Queensland, there's a grazier out there. That grazier is what we call like a cattle rancher in Australia. He owns right. a bunch of cattle properties, okay? Well, there's a pretty wealthy cattle grazier Gordon and I knew. And he had three sons. And he would not let any of the sons come back after high school and work the family ranch until they'd worked three years 
working out in the real world. And if they quit their job or they got fired, they didn't get to come back to the, to the ranch to work. But the trick was he picked the people they went and worked for. He picked the biggest assholes God ever put on the earth in Australia to work for. Because he said, there's no point these boys coming back to the ranch when everything's paid for, all new trucks, all new trailers, all this shit. They got to see what the real world has to offer. They don't get the real world here because they're under my protection. They need to get out there and and very few parents have got the balls to fucking do that. Like how many generational businesses get past the third generation? Very few. Most of them don't get past the second. Very few. Because by the grandchildren, they're fucking off the money. They didn't have to sweat for it. They didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to. It was just there. So so I would suspect, if I had to guess as a parent, one of the hardest things to do is to say to a kid, no, you can't have it, especially when you have the money. If you're poor, it's pretty easy. Fuck off. I don't have the money. You're done. But if you have the money and the kid wants it, I probably suspect, I don't have any, but I'm guessing it might be a little hard to say that. But you you need to because you, you're just giving them a false sense of what fucking reality is. It's the struggle that makes it real. When I got here, I didn't have a plan B. There's no inheritance for me. There's no big trust fund. There's no money there. Okay? So I had to act like, okay, I'm, I've got to have enough money put away for retirement. How am I going to get this done? There's no plan B here. And that's that's what they're lacking, most of the kids now. They're just heartless little pricks because they're given every fucking thing. Toughen them up. When I, was, when I was making money, when I was 10, 11, 12 making money, my parents made me and my sister pay board. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't a lot. It was like like 25% of whatever we made. So if it was $10, they took $2.50 out of it. Yeah. It was the lesson about no nothing's free, motherfucker. See this roof over your head? See the lights? It all costs money. So from a very early age, our parents taught me and my sister, nothing's for free. Pay up. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So, so even though we didn't make a lot, they took 25% of it. But it got me thinking, nothing, there's no free ride. So by the time I left high school at 15, I wasn't expecting a free ride. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's a lesson you get to learn, like if your parents train horses Uh because there's so much goddamn work that has to be done and i mean i can't think of a single day from the time i was like 11 to when i did get done with high school or quit going to high school uh that i wasn't up at 5 a.m feeding horses yes and then you leave school all you do is ride the shittiest of the horses i mean i had to break all the colts because no one else would do it yeah and i couldn't tell my dad no yeah that's exactly right (laughs) now i'm the one getting smashed into the panels And, uh, yeah, the, the horse training didn't go quite as well and the marketing wasn't quite as well. So yeah, we were, so I, I, I got, so I got into the clinician, <laughs> I got into the clinician deal because I knew there was money there. I was good at it. It was a necessity and I stayed with it, you know, deep down inside, I always wanted to be a horse trainer. You know, I wanted to, you know, a, a guy that started, it's kind of a joke, but Andrea Fapani is a, a very successful random horse trainer, one millions. We kind of got started in America roughly the same time. I tried to get a job with John Slack and Todd Bergen and Brett Stone out there in Arizona, and Andrea beat me to that job by about two weeks on the phone. So he got that job, and <clears> I didn't, which ultimately, because if, if I would have got that job, my whole path might have been a whole different ball game. So for many years, I'll be honest about this, I kind of resented down under horsemanship a little bit because I felt like it stole the best 20 years of my life. Like Stole I'm four, time from you. I'm 26 years old now. I felt like, you know, Andreas won almost $6 million in reigning. I wanted to be him. I could have been him. I know myself enough that if I would have gone a different direction in life, nothing was going to stop me from being successful. But I kind of resented down under that. I was like, fuck me. I fucked off 20 years of my life doing this clinician deal when I really wanted to be a horse trainer. And I had a little resentment there about my business for many years. Sure, I made a lot of money, but it wasn't my passion. It wasn't what I really wanted to do. Okay. And then one of my other mentors, a guy called Doug Carpenter, he passed away, unfortunately, last year of coronavirus. And, um, when he was alive about a year earlier than that, I was kind of bitching him on the phone about, you know, a little bit of resentment that I wasted 20 years of my life doing down under when I should have been training horses and winning. And he listened to me and he finally said to me, he said, Clinton, he said, you know how many world championship buckles and AQHA world championship trophies I got? And I said, no. He said, I got probably 12, 13 of them. He said, you know where they all are? And I said, no. He said, they're all in the back room of my house in boxes, in a closet, covered with fucking tarnish. 
And he said, I'm out here at 63 years of age and I'm still selling horses and getting commissions because I don't have enough money to retire on. He said, you didn't fuck up. You're 43 and just retired. He, he said, you didn't make the wrong decision. And that kind of hit me in the chest pretty hard. It's like, oh, he's fucking, that struck a nerve. You know, he, he said, you know how much I would give up all those world championship buckles and world championship trophies to be you and retire at 43? Yeah, yeah. Would I do that? Hell yeah, I would. So that took away a lot of like 90% of the little bit of resentment I had there that maybe I went the wrong direction in life. And then I was at another horse trainer's place maybe in six months ago, very successful guy, won millions in what he does. And he, he said to me, he said, I'm a little fucking worried what I'm going to do. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm, I'm sore. I'm crippled. I'm kind of at the top of my career and I'm, I'm just about to go over the other side, down the other side. And he said, I don't think I put enough money away. And he said, I'm not going to starve, but he said, I didn't put your money away. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is all I know is to ride horses. And I could fucking see the fear in his eyes. And this is somebody that I really have a lot of respect for and did extremely well in the Western industry. I'm not going to say what discipline it was, okay? And this is a hard-working, successful guy. And I walked away from that conversation. That, that completely erased any, any resentment in my mind that I did the wrong thing. I will probably never win the Rain of Futurity. I'll probably never win the Cowboys Futurity. I'll probably never win the events in my heart that I would have liked to have won. Okay, but I've made peace with that now because I'm going to enjoy the next 20, 30 years of my fucking life and never have to worry about money ever again. That's my peace right there. So I get to wake up, go to the barn at eight, ride seven of the dirtiest motherfucking bred horses in the country, leave at three and enjoy my life. Does that make sense? I won't win my goals. I won't win. Could I win at 46? Yeah, but shit, I'd have to go back to the barn 12, 13 hours a day and I'm not willing to do it. Let's just be honest. If you want to be number one, it's going to take 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, working your ass off to be number one. And honestly, at my age, I don't have the drive for it anymore. I don't want to do that. I did that with Down Under. I know what it took to be successful in my business. And I know if I'm still going to be that successful in another industry, you know, it's horses, but, it, you know, horse training is a different industry. I know what it takes. And I suppose I'm not willing to pay that token. Does that make sense? Because I've just looked at a guy that has been extremely successful at what he does and is wondering what the fuck he did with his career. Was it worth it? Problem with, with any monetary successes, right? I mean, money's a little different, right? Because if you bank it, then you've got it. But monetary successes, like in rodeo, it's gold buckles, right? It's it's world titles. It's AQHA this. It's, it's whatever it's it is. It's even worse than your... Like, oh, I'm it's not, hard in this industry. It's terrible. Less like, money. I, 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 you know... I don't know your industry intimately by any means, but I've often kind of shook my head of how many people that I've seen their name on TV or the NFR that have been big time competitors that I found out later on in life, they're old and broke. They got no money. They're bumming off people. 98%. And, and I'm like, how the fuck does this happen to you? How do you be this successful at what you do and at one time collect this much money and not do something positive with it? Because you get that high and it's just like fucking, just like you said, crack and you chase that, but it's way more expensive to play the game of rodeo mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. And it is a play with even crack. You're better off having the hobby of crack than you are horses. Yeah. Frankly, yeah. Yeah. As, as most people and most people you get stuck, right? Like you, if someone told you, you can't do what you've done your whole life to make money and said, you got to do something else. You're going to be pretty lost for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the, like there's certain philosophers and psychologists like modern day ones out there who will preach like how valuable the spoken word is. If you're a person who can turn words mm -hmm. and make that kind of your thing to make money, which you have, like that's 90% of, of being able to do anything is explain it. Well, mm -hmm. like you could be a great horse trainer and a great, uh, this and that, but if you can't take articulate that it, yeah. and articulate it, then you're, you're just pointless. And so, so I, I had a natural gift to the gab. My mother always said people either got people skills or they don't. Okay, so I did have a little natural gift there that I could, I'm a good bullshitter, okay? Um, and I, but I'm the first to say I'm not the best clinician. In fact, I can go further. There are many other horsemen and women around the world that are much better at training a horse than me. I never claim to be the best horse trainer, the best clinician, etc. 
okay? What, what I did is I just explained it better than everybody else. I made money from it better than everybody else. Because it, you simplified it I better simp- than I everybody made it, else. Here's, here's what the light went off, okay? I didn't realize, this will piss a few people off, but fuck it, it is what it is. Like, I didn't realize, because when you live in a country, you just expect, you think whatever your country is, is what the world is. And when you go to a new country, it's like, whoa, this shit's different here. So when I came from Australia to America, I was shocked at where the bar was for what people expected out of horse training. Like in, a, like in Australia, you, somebody sends you a four-year-old Mustang that's never been touched before. In six weeks, you've got to have it caught, saddled, stand on its back, crack a whip, go gather cattle up on it, side pass, open shut gates, back it in circles, spin it, roll it back, ride the sun bitch into a trailer bridleless. I mean, fuck a duck. Like what they expect you to do in Australia is mind-boggling in six weeks. Well, that's just the culture over there. You know, they, they expect a lot for their money. When I came to America, I just kind of thought, well, it's, fuck it, it's just like Australia. I'll never forget this. I get a job in Whitesboro, Texas, working for this guy. And uh, he's a rain and horse trainer. And I'm there like three, four days, and I get, you know, 10 colts to ride, 10 horses to ride. So I get one of these horses is a two-year-old filly. And I ride this thing, and it's just a hunger dog shit. I mean, it, it, it acts like it's had 10 ridings of life and 10 bad rides too. It's pulling on you, doesn't know left and right. It's fucking horrible. So I walk in the barn, and then I ask the barn manager, I said, how long has this horse been here? Like, I'm thinking maybe it's his third fucking ride. Seriously, it's that green. And the lady says, oh, it's been here three months, 90 days. And I'm thinking, and, and this is back in the days when I held my tongue a lot better. I'm thinking, what the fuck? This thing's been in training for 90 days and it rides like this hunk of dog shit. So I don't say anything. I said, fuck it, I'll just fix it. So I go to riding it. Well, the next day, the boss walks up to me and says, hey, um, the owners of that filly are showing up to come see it. And I shit. Because I'm thinking, man, these people are going to be pissed the fuck off. This horse has been in training for three months and acts like a fucking colt with 10 rides. And he says, don't tell him it's not going to make a fertility horse. Don't tell him anything. Just smile and ride it. And I'm, yes, sir. Well, I ride this fucking thing like three times a day for two days until I show <laughs> up, okay? Because I'm shitting bricks. Because I'm thinking, fuck, they're going to get mad at me. They're going to rip me a new asshole because they spent 90 days of horse training and this fucking thing's riding like a pile of shit. So I, I ride it three times a day for two days and it rides a little better. Not much. The owners show up, so I get it out and I ride it around the slide track and 10, 15 minutes and I come back to the people and my head's hot, my head's low on the ground. Like I'm expecting an ass chewing. Like I'm like, <laughs> okay, Clinton, line up, pull your pants down, get your ass fucking man up. And I say, well, you know, guys, this is what your horse does. I shit you not. These fucking people looked at me and said, oh my God, she's doing so well. I can't believe how she's doing so great. This is great for 90 days. I mean, fucking shock. Pure blank on my face. I'm like, <laughs> you got to be fucking kidding me, correct? Look, you're not actually happy with what you've just paid for, have you? Oh, no. We're, I didn't say that. This is what's going through my mind. Right. So I dodge a bullet. They're happy as fucking pig in mud. And I'm thinking, this has got to be just really fucking stupid people. This is a one-off deal. Oh, no. No, that's... That's, that's the culture. It is. This is where I'm not running America down. I want to make that real fucking clear. I love this country. Love the people in it. But the standard of culture of what people expect from fucking horses is way less than Australia. Because in Australia, if you can't catch it with a bridle, jump on it bareback, ride it back to the barn, stand on its fucking back and crack a whip and go gather up cattle, you don't get paid in six weeks. You don't get paid, period. See, in Australia, owners have horse trainers by the balls. In America, horse trainers have owners by the balls. Oh, you absolutely. see the difference? It's a whole different mindset over here. So the next few horses I train, same attitude. These people are fucking happy with a little bit of left lead after 90 days and a little bit of light, right lead. And I'm thinking, motherfucker, if you think this shit's good, wait till I get done with my six-week Aussie program. And that's what Down Under Horsemanship was. I tell you why I was successful. I wasn't better than the other clinicians as far as a horseman. I outworked them. That's where I really beat them. If I did a 10 you hour were willing to do it. I, if I did a 10 hour day, I did a 14 hour day. If I did five expos in a year, I did 10 expos in a year. I just outworked my competition till they just gave up. I outworked them to death. And the second other reason I was really good is because I realized when I got to America, you better dummy up your program. 
meaning that you better break it into steps that a 65 year old lady that's never ridden a horse before and needs a mounting block to get on how do you keep her alive and make money from her that's as simple as it got so i designed a program to make people that were inexperienced safe with their horses not get hurt not get killed have an enjoyable experience but i didn't have to teach like that in australia in australia people rode as a culture a lot better they didn't have the greatest horsemanship skills back then but they could ride the fucking hair off anything but when i got to america the culture as a general trail riding industry couldn't ride very well the fucking wind change direction they, they were thinking about coming off you get what i'm saying so i had to change a lot of techniques to make it safe for them to make sure they got you know dead people don't fucking spend money <laughs> rule number one in business don't fucking kill your customer <laughs> Yeah, which you would think you wouldn't have to say that in most business, but this is uh, horses after all. Every major injury I think I've ever had has come from a horse. I'm sure it's the same for you. Well, yeah, but that's what Gordon McKinley taught me. When your body is your greatest asset, don't get hurt. Yeah. You can't get hurt being a horse trainer because if you are, you're screwed. Now, I'm not saying you can't tr work or train a horse if you're disabled or got a problem, but you, it's hard to do it professionally. You get crushed by 900 pounds, though. You're not coming out of that good yeah usually, I, I i was so. very i never rode out bucking horses i was never the bravest cowboy out there i was the pussy that's out there making sure the cult didn't buck yep but touch wood I'd probably get killed fucking walking across the street tonight but touch wood in 28 years of doing this professionally i've never been seriously hurt from a horse been fucked up in a couple of divorces but i've never been hurt <laughs> training horses does that make sense yeah. uh, it definitely <laughs> does because yeah, i've definitely been hurt by both those things <laughs> but uh i mean I think it's I think it's really valuable to come at people the way you kind of have like when we're talking because you get a lot of like this pretty everything's presented on this neat little plate and you know for your grandma lady you were yeah. talking about you know not the one who bent you over but the other one the yeah. one that you were keeping alive <laughs> that one I remember you, both you do I had, yeah, I had the crying grandmother or the other one that fucked me up the ass yeah. like I had one and you of probably the... have a video series from both too <laughs> absolutely I made money I, I figured out if I'm gonna get an ass rape and god damn it I'm gonna make money from it <laughs> yeah that's right make sure you get high quality cameras though because that's something you didn't have on the VHS it's exactly <laughs> People but, will pay for anything. <laughs> I mean, they will. What's hey, the there's only a fucking fans? fetish for anything out there. <laughs> there really there's is. A, there's, a, there's a lady that's going to pay to see a 95-year-old woman strap on and fuck me up the ass. <laughs> well, if you do go broke again, give us a call. We'll sponsor Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's uh, funny. But, but I think it is, like, in all jokes aside, I think it's really valuable for people, especially people who are aspiring to maybe be horse trainers or clinicians or whatever the hell, or professional cowboys or rainers or cutters or yeah, not the English people because, you know, they already have it figured out, as you said. But, they, uh, they're smarter than us, uh, let me tell you. Uh, those are uh, elitists. They yeah. just figured out how to make money. Dressage industry, they charge by the ride, yeah. like 60, 80 bucks per ride. Yeah. They don't, there's none of this monthly bullshit. They, they charge per ride. They figured out, like, other than New York or California, a residential electrician makes $60 an hour. Yeah. He went to school for four years in apprenticeship to be an electrician. Horse trainers go to school to be a horse trainer. They have hard, hard knocks. They work a lot of hours. They pay their dues. You should be worth 60 bucks an hour. If you're not worth 60 bucks an hour, what the fuck are you doing? Go be a plumber. Yeah. That's as simple as it gets. So if you're not making $60 an hour training horses, figure out what the fuck you're doing wrong and do something about it. Because that's, that's, what that's what a residential electrician and any, well, maybe not now with the fucking housing booming, but at least a year or two ago, other than New York and California, who the fuck want to live in either state, okay, make 60 bucks an hour being a residential electrician with a four-year apprenticeship. I did an apprenticeship. Everybody in the Western industry does their hardcore apprenticeship. Figure out how to make 60 bucks an hour. Because if you're not, you're undervaluating yourself. Absolutely. That's a good That's lesson. the way I look at it. People should listen. Maybe maybe yeah. if enough people listen, and I mean, a lot of people will listen to this, maybe it'll actually evoke some change. It would be nice. A lot of these people are hardworking people. So I'm not, I don't want to come across as I'm criticizing them personally or their character, their work ethic or their honesty. They're great people. They're just undervaluing themselves too much. And then, and then they're old and crippled and broke, and they wonder what the fuck happened to their career. Yeah, and forgotten. That's why. That's why your your buddy who shall not be named doesn't give a shit about his buckles because yes. no one else cares either. That's that's exactly what he said to me. He put yeah. it in perspective. Yeah, he said I would trade all those buckles for you to take your career in a heartbeat. 
that and I this guy was a big mentor to me and a father figure and that really hit me at home like okay Clinton quit your bitching you made a lot of money sure you sucked a lot of old lady dick and took it up the ass but fuck it you made some money from it so I've made peace with that now I'll never win the fraternity I'll never win what I want but I go to the horse show to have fun I ride four or five horses you know, everybody likes to see me fail. I'm the guy that rides in. Everybody's hoping is going to fucking trip over and fall on my head. I get it. I kind of get off on it, in fact. But I go there to have fun. I'm, I, I'd like to win. I'd like to be competitive. But in the back of my mind, I know, Clinton, you are not working hard enough. And you, and more than anything, you're not riding the volume of horses. you got to be riding 15 horses a day, just slumming it, to get the pick of them, the volume of horses, to be competitive. There's a... There's a price to be paid for success. I don't give a shit what it is, whether you're a bodybuilder, whether you're fucking gymnastics, horses. Success comes at a price. Typically your family, typically your personal life, typically uh, uh, your friends and relatives all pay a price. Because when you want to be number one at anything, you've got to wake up thinking about it. You've got to go to bed thinking about it. It's got to be seven days a week. It's got to consume you. You know, I read a... Um, autobiography of Arnold Schwarzenegger and when he was getting ready for his last Olympia win his dad died he didn't go to the funeral because it was right in the middle of his prep time last two or three weeks leading up to the Olympia contest and if he would have flown over to Germany missed his training missed his meals missed his work schedule he he probably wouldn't have won Mr. Olympia that's pretty fucking serious isn't it you missed your fucking father's funeral so half the people who listen to that well probably three quarters say you piece of shit you missed your father's funeral, okay? He didn't look at it like that. He said, I have to make a choice. Do I want to fucking win or do I want to go to my father's funeral? I can't do both, okay? Now, maybe he can live with that. Maybe he can't. I don't know. Don't know the guy, but I know he's a legend. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but I'm saying when I say there is a price to be paid for success, I'm literally meaning that. I, I don't have any children. People ask, why don't I have kids? I had a business called Down on a Horsemanship. It was a needy little motherfucker. For 20 years, it's tugging at my skirt. Daddy, 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 daddy. I knew I'd be a shitty father because I'd pick my business over my kid. I've been divorced twice. It, it, when you walk those extreme hours and you dedicate that much of your life to something, something else has to give. And generally marriages, other people can't handle that. Marriages, children, whatever. So I didn't want to have kids. People say, well, you're a selfish motherfucker for not having kids. I look at it the opposite. Any idiot can have a kid. But can you raise the little motherfucker? I didn't want to be a shitty dad and not be there. If I was going to be there, I wanted to be there. I didn't want to be an absentee father. You know, what guy said to me one time, he said about kids, he said, Clinton, this is the deal about kids. You either spend time with them when they're little or they'll make you spend time with them when they're older. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if you don't spend time with them when they're little, when they're 18 and in jail and you're having to bail them out, they'll make you spend time with them then. <laughs> when they're in drug fucking rehab, they'll make you spend time with them then. So you either spend time when they're little and get the little pricks shaped up and broke and leading good and hold to broke tied up to the fucking tree, or you ignore the little fuckers and they run wild and then you'll have to hold to break this son of a bitch at 15 years old. One's a lot tougher. So I knew that kind of in instinctively early. So that's why I didn't have kids because I knew I would pick my career. I was so driven to be successful in my business that I knew that I would pick that over anything else, women, wives, etc. So you pay a price for that. Does that make sense? Some people say you made the wrong choice. That's okay. I don't blame them for that. I don't think I made the wrong choice. Maybe when I'm 90, I will think that, but I don't now. You know what I mean? Maybe I will one day, but, you know, I, I don't now. That's all that matters, right? But there is a price for success. That's why it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. Yeah, and maybe some people figure it out to where they can balance and leverage everything, a luck, the lucky few, but I don't, I don't think so. Look at how many wildly successful people's kids are absolute fucking disasters. Yes, because they're working 90 hours a week. And, and they never, the kids don't get it. They don't appreciate, like, wow, look at this great life. They're like, oh, daddy wasn't there for me. Exactly. That's Actually, we all do that sometimes. Yeah, but yeah. That, but that's, there. you just, you, when everything's important, I figured this out in business, when everything's important, nothing's important. When everything's important, nothing's important. You can only focus on one thing at a time. So if that's your thing, be that thing. Run at it, focus at it, look at it, hit it with the arrow every time. 
but you can't focus on everything and make it successful. So for 20 something years, down under was my focus. Sure, the business is still going, but it's not my focus anymore. I'm retired. I still keep it going. It still makes money. Everything's good, but it's not what I do to wake up every day now. You know what I mean? I do other things now. You know, fun's my focus now. Having fun with my horses, enjoying my horses. You know, I don't want to go to the horse show with 15 fucking horses and and dread getting on the 15th horse because I'm exhausted. I want to ride four or five and go have a couple of drinks with my friends. You know what I mean? So, But there's a price to pay for that, isn't it? I won't win, won't be successful because I'm not willing to hit it hard enough to be successful. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things you said earlier, I was thinking about that and there's world champions at everything, people like yourself, whoever, would, who would switch with somebody else, right? So I bet you there's every guy that you see out there winning would still switch with you, like just mm-hmm. like you said. And you might switch with them just to get a taste of what it's like, but I guarantee you'd probably never sign that contract permanently. Not right? anymore. I no. let all that go. When, I, when that horse trainer looked at me and I could see the fucking little bit of fear in his eyes, that hit me hard, like, oh, my God, I wanted to be you. Yeah. And now you're fucking telling me you're scared of what the fuck's going to happen in the next half of your life. Because let's face it, I'm like a horse trainer. I can barely turn a computer on. I only got email fucking 15 years ago because my mother did it first. I'm not tax savvy. I can't do anything else. Yeah, learn to code is not a fun I can't do you. anything except talk to people and train horses. And I'm not really a horse trainer. I was a people trainer. I made money from selling information. I packaged it. I figured out how to sell it. And I, I adapted as the market adapted. I adapted to the changes that needed to be made and I made it popular around the world. I sold information. I didn't really train horses. I sold information. Information is a perceived value again. Yep. That's what makes the world go around. Well, Clint, I, I think this was a pretty valuable conversation. I'm glad you, I'm glad all the stars aligned and your arm got twisted or whatever the hell happened. I don't know. I just agreed to it. I didn't even, some lady, random lady texted me. I didn't even know who it was. I said, you want to do a podcast? I said, oh, fuck it. I'll do it. Yeah. I'm in Fort Worth. Listen, I didn't even know who you were when I walked in here. No, that's, that's fair. It's nice to not be known sometimes. (laughs) Makes for a more genuine uh, interaction. Yeah, I've enjoyed your conversation and and I'll I'll subscribe to your podcast now. Now that I know what you are, I'll subscribe to your podcast and I'll tell them. My, my uh, followers to to uh, subscribe to it as well. Well, we'll cut some really good clips and I'll send them to you because be, I think you this, gave us this some pretty pod, good this Instagram This podcast clips. will either be widely hated or widely successful. I promise you there will be no in between with this. Oh, no, no. It's it's right. <laughs> our, our hired producer right here. Like, he'll tell you this is this is kind of the way that it is. Good. We say fuck a lot on this show. And then yeah, we'll have I, a, I'm not, a televangelist on and we won't say it at all. We'll go all into the Jesus. I'm, I'm going to say this is probably the most cussing that we've had on, but probably one of the most fun I've had listening to this. Yeah. You will have fun with me. I promise you that. Even with people that hate my guts, I say, listen, just come have a drink with me. We'll have a good time. I'm not I'm not as big an asshole as everybody says I am. I'm really not. I'm actually a pretty good guy. I like to have fun, enjoy your company, bullshit, and let your hair down. And uh, a lot of people would dislike me if I'd actually just come have a drink with me. They we'd probably get along pretty good. So yeah, it's better to be in your face, right? Because a lot of people act like you know their authentic self. You never get to see it in this industry. It's not that I'm. I don't want to be necessarily in people's face. I just I just can't lie to people. Yeah. You know, and when I say that, sure, I lied twenty years ago when I said I had a fucking <laughs> barn full of horses. But you, I can't just be counterfeit. Being counterfeit is really difficult for me. It, it, I struggle with it a lot. Like every once in a while, I'll have to be counterfeit with a with a customer that spent three hundred thousand dollars on a horse or something like that. Ooh, it wears on me. I, I if I don't like you, I don't want to do business with you. You know, so it it very much I struggle to to be counterfeit like that. If I just can't be me, and you be you, it drains the shit out of me. You know what I mean? So so the cool thing about America, this is why it's the greatest country in the world. There's something for everybody. If you don't like me, fucking pick John Lynch. You don't like John, pick Pat Pirelli. You don't like him, pick this person. There's a million of us out there, and I'm not even frightened to say that we're all doing the same shit. We really are. Forwards, backwards, left and right, motherfucker. That's about it. We're all got the same shit going on, except we all deliver it a different way. We all message it a different way. Some guys teach better. Some guys market better. Some guys do both. 
You, you get what I'm saying? So I've never tried to be, I've never ever said I'm the best, never said I'm the greatest. This is just who I am. You either like it or you don't. And if you like it, awesome. And if you don't, that's okay too. I want you to go get help from somebody that you identify with. I think people identify with personalities more than what they even do techniques. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they want to know, if, can they identify with this person on a human level? Do they like their character? Do they like this? Do they like that? Like John Lyons? I like John. I really do. I think he was a pioneer in this whole industry. I don't think John quite gets anywhere near the credit that he really deserves. Like, you know, Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt, I think a lot of them got a lot of credit more than actually they should have deserved. I know that'll piss a few fucking Nevada people off, okay? But John Lyons did a hell of a lot for the horsemanship industry, making it commercialized and to the mainstream masses. But he doesn't get anywhere near the amount of credit that, say, Tom Dorrance got or Ray Hunt, etc. But even though I like John to death, you couldn't pick polar opposite horse trainers than me and him or clinicians. He's never going to fucking swear. He's never going to tell a dirty joke. He's never going to be politically incorrect. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So he's got a certain niche of people that really get off on that shit. Now, me, when I watch John, I love him to death, but fuck me, I'd rather watch paint dry than watch him train a horse. I just want to shoot myself in the head. It's fucking so boring. But those people that love John watch me and, oh, my God, the first fucking F-bomb out of my mouth, they freak out and run out the door and want a refund and all kinds of shit. So it's not that I'm right and John's wrong or John's right and I'm wrong. It's just different. The cool thing about America is there's something for everybody. Yeah. If, some, if there's something for you in this country, it's such a great country. It is. I get real hung up on one thing with you saying all that, though, and it's what I'm trying to figure out is why is it the comatose old ladies who are so into you specifically? <laughs> I don't know. I think I, you know what I think it's is. Is it the accent? <laughs> Andrea, Andrea Fapani said this to me one day because I did a podcast with him and it was a lot like this, a little different, but a lot like this. And so Andrea says to me, he says, because I did a podcast with him and we, we I was just me and, uh, and he was him. He was swearing a bit and so forth. And he's, and it was the most popular podcast he's had on his deal. Yeah. And uh, he calls me up and he says, he says, I don't know how the fuck you do it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're the only guy I know that can insult his own customers and they love you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. And he laughed too. He said, I don't know how you pull it off. And I said, I don't really know either. I think deep down inside, they know I'm not trying to stab him in the heart. I'm just, I'm just talking the way I talk. And I think deep down inside, they kind of know. Most women deep down inside know they're a fucking pain in the ass. Deep down in their heart, <laughs> they really fucking know they're a pain in the ass. Now, There's no way you've been divorced. Like, <laughs> no fucking way. Nope, not so, talking like so that. They just, they just they laugh at me and I laugh with them. And, and again, I'm not for everybody and I'm okay with that because whoever I offend, there'll be somebody for that person that won't offend them. And I, I just want them to be safe, all jokes aside. I want people to be safe, have fun with their horse, enjoy it and go home and see their family at the end of the day. That's really what I want. Yeah. Righto? Right. I Cheers. Mean, it's, it's as good a reason as any. Thank you guys. Thank you. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Make sure to rate and review this podcast, as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.